I think uh, we have just gone live. So uh, as some of you know, this morning we already uh, experienced this at the start of the conference uh, that we uh, had a live stream and then also we're here physically in, in person. And uh, yeah, we're starting this again right now. So this session is also um, being recorded and will last for about uh, an hour and a half. So yeah, um, for everyone that's joining us online, uh, this has been the end of a, of a long day. We've had uh, many fruitful discussions here in, in workshops at the Heinrich Böll Foundation. And uh, yeah, we'll start with uh, a keynote coming up and then a panel debate. And uh, all this will be introduced shortly. I just have some very quick remarks. Yeah, we should be about an hour and a half and then we'll be offline again and uh, we'll have dinner. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to briefly remark that we have a, a publication coming out um, also with the organizers of this conference. So basically, uh, yeah, Heinrich Böll Foundation, Finanzwende Recherche, and the Zoe Institute. It's called The Great Turnaround. A lot of the, um, yeah, uh, acad academ um, a lot of the people from academia here have actually uh, contributed. And um, this should be out on social media, the Böll social media soon. And so this, um, yeah, something to, to definitely look out for. And um, yeah, and then uh, basically I will hand it over to um, Imre Scholz, the president of the Bell Foundation, and who will open up the, the discussion tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So welcome uh, to all of you for this um, panel dis discussion at the first evening of your important closing uh, conference of, of this project on transfor um, transformative responses to, to crisis. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you, Sven uh, Giegold, as a representative of, of the German government. Uh, we, will go, we will discuss um, the Green Deal after the Zeitenwende, so after the turn of times, um, which has been defined by the German chancellor. And we will check out together with you uh, whether what the state of the art is, the state of implementation is of the European Green Deal, is it transformative as we expected it to be? Uh, what is uh, the relationship between the German uh, Easter package to implement the, you know, the Green Deal and the European approach? Um, and what is actually the impact of, of the Ukraine war? on climate policy, on implementing the European Green Deal. Maybe we can have time and also look at the implications uh, it has on reorganizing um, uh, global supply chains, um, the economic uh, order. What does that mean, also from a geopolitical perspective, for, for reaching the, the goals of, of the, Euro uh, the European Green Deal? And finally, that would be really great if we also could discuss about the, the international and global impl uh, implications of um, this new situation. As we know, climate change has to be fought globally, and uh, developing countries, the global south, uh, needs uh, support from, from Europe. And uh, one fear is obviously that with the war, um, priorities might change and support and cooperation uh, at international level might suffer. So, but let me first welcome you, uh, Sven Giegold, State Secretary at the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action. I still have to read that uh, new name. It's an unusual combination of climate policy and economic policy in Germany. And you are, a, as far as I understand, a friend and partner of the foundation. Uh, during the, your 12 years at the European Parliament, and obviously also before that as founder of ATTAC or as founder, uh, co-founder of the Tax Justice Network. And what I'm saying here illustrates that you are not only an economist by training, but also by passion. Uh, you have a strong passion for changing financial systems and, and economic systems so that they serve sustainability as well as economic and social justice and promote the common good, not a usual formulation of objectives for economic policy and at government level. And at the ministry, you are responsible for European policy, for economic policy, for development policy as part of international economic relations, and uh, economy for the common good and arms export control. 
So you have a broad range. <laughs> and sometimes some things need to be done by someone, but you cover a broad range of responsibilities, which gives you, I think, many instruments in your hand to, to uh, try and achieve some of your objectives. And I think it will be very interesting to discuss that with you. I thank you for sharing your precious time with us in the keynote and later joining the panel, where we will be also joined by Adam Tooze and by Samantha Smith, but I will uh, introduce you when you, we are on the panel. So please, uh, Sven, join us here. Yeah, thank you very much for this, uh, for this warm welcome. And uh, as we are live streamed, uh, I have to make some uh, remarks before starting. Um, first, uh, it's really great, I, and I say this with uh, full respect, that while Greens uh, in the government are struggling with implementation, the Heinrich Böll Foundation talks about transformative politics and uh, discusses uh, how to reorganize the economic system. I know Jörg Haas a long time ago. Uh, at the time when I first met him, it was the other way around. He was sitting in the foundation defending the realpolitik of the first red-green government, and I was talking transformative policies. Now it's uh, the other way around. It's not w without irony. Uh, and, uh, and I already made some... Uh, uh, interesting experiences. So Imma just said that the place where I'm now is highly, um, a highly surprising uh, place for me to be. So this state secretary is not a boring bureaucrat, but it's basically the same position Müller Amak had when he set up uh, the social market economy uh, model. And now it's me. So uh, highly uh, surprising. So when I gave my first uh, uh, press uh, conference in my new role, it had a lot of interesting responses. Uh, and I had to learn the hard way what it means uh, to be a government official. When you are a parliamentarian, first of all, most of what you said is not taken very seriously because it's only an opinion. And uh, then it's a green opinion, which is not the biggest party in the European Parliament. So you can say a lot of things without being noticed too much. Uh, now, being in this position, it's not Sven having an interesting idea uh, and responding to your intellectual in chief of that uh, process, Adam Tooth, uh, as it seems to me. Uh, and. Uh, so as soon as I'm responding to these issues, uh, it, uh, the headline will be uh, quarrel in the German government. Uh, it may be that I could um, agree with uh, some of your ideas, like printing money for green uh, investment or um, uh, borrowing on a massive scale in euro bonds. And, uh, and if I would raise these sort of ideas, it would be immediately the German government uh, launching a new debate on euro bonds and uh, this is uh, obviously uh, not what I would have ever thought about. Uh, it's obviously not what I could ever defend and I will not today. So, but this makes uh, an, a debate uh, not easy because government is not about uh, talking about Zeitenwende uh, but doing it. So this means the debate which leads to turnarounds, which are of course also shaped by governments, is not about public talk, it's about doing it at the right moment when the political momentum is there. But if you announce it through public debates, in particular in coalition agreements, with, uh, which you don't have to suffer from in certain countries with a lot of negative side effects of that, but here, if one coalition party makes controversial statements, it's only raising the counter position of your partner and making basically any change impossible. And I'm saying this so openly, not because it's specific to your issues, the same problem our other coalition partners have. So therefore, there are lots of things I can dream of, I can think about, uh, but I can't say it. And therefore, I'm was tasked to give a keynote 
which means to say something interesting on a highly big and provocative uh, issue without causing a lot of trouble. <laughs> so, uh, and some of you know me here quite well, so therefore I will try to do this now, nevertheless. And, uh, and you, uh, we all have to uh, take our respective roles into consideration. So, uh, we have already started in this government in a situation which was often described as being in a multitude of crises. And the amount of crises globally, as well as in Europe, as well as nationally, were so multifold uh, that many doubted the ability of democracy to deal with this, and or even of global institutions and states. And now we got free of charge another beautiful crisis, which is, of course, this horrible war, this, uh, these atrocities, this breach of um, international law. And, uh, and this crisis, now uh, the Ukrainian-Russian war, um, leads to a new disruption on top of all the disruptions we had anyway. And this has uh, very different, uh, very specific effects in the current situation. On the one hand, uh, I just was yesterday at the European Energy Council, and it's now uh, in a row of council meetings that I saw how this uh, body, which I only criticized before from the outside as not being able to act and so on, now I'm sitting there, it's also a bit weird, after 12 years in the European Parliament, they were always our adversaries, now I'm there and uh, listening to it. But what's really surprising is that um, it has created a unity uh, to another level. And in particular, it has over helped the, this conflict has overcome uh, the typical East-West uh, division in many issues, not fundamentally. Of course, these countries have different histories and this has consequences for their respective political positions. But however, it is highly surprising to listen to the Polish energy minister speaking about the need to boost renewable energy uh, without, uh, without mentioning uh, to defend coal and all the rest of it. Or uh, you look uh, to Bulgaria being the first with Poland to disrupt uh, their relationship with, uh, with Gazprom. And if you know how this country works and uh, the importance of Luke Oil there, and highly surprising. And um, so uh, basically, it's really sh differences in, in, in particular concerning the Green Deal, which is uh, in the headline of your event, uh, have really changed. So before there was some countries also in Eastern and Central Europe strongly supportive, but now there's basically, it's very hard to find anyone who is against, really against it. So, of course, when you then start discussing the legislation, uh, everybody has their national nitty-gritty vested interests, including us. Huh? So, but there, that is normal. But now we have much more unity, East uh, and West. And uh, therefore, uh, this is important to, to have in mind when it comes to what will this crisis mean to the current situation. So, for Germany, first of all, to say that, um, we will continue with our own transformative policies, which we have agreed in the coalition agreement. So, they are transformative. So, if you look at what we have agreed there, uh, is uh, truly transformative. And uh, I would say that because um, it means that uh, what we have agreed in particular with a view to modernizing the state, digitalization, and uh, the climate transformation are three areas where this government has said we will do things fundamentally different, and also in the relationship to Europe, which has been uh, described in the coalition agreement, uh, there are really strong um, changes. And uh, nobody should belittle this. And I know progressive economists, when they sit together without anybody watching, they judge from a, from a totally different planet. So uh, they think about, are these Germans still in their Ordnungspolitik uh, frame or not? Yeah? So uh, we Germans probably always will, but, uh, uh, sorry, Adam, uh, is, uh, but the question is, 
Um, still, that this means we will change profoundly our industrial model to the better. And this is really strong. And, uh, and the current situation, if may, some people still dreamt they could stop it, the energy transition, now it's over. Because uh, our policies have received an additional source of legitimacy, because it's now also about national security and European security. It's not anymore uh, uh, something we do for our children, which should be reason enough for everyone to do it, but we know it's not like this. Now it is a question of national security and national interest. And, uh, and that is uh, truly important. So if you look at how this Easter package was received in the German public, highly surprising. 600 pages or 500 pages of law, highly controversial things, lots of things which uh, years and years of talk about climate policies were not able to produce. And now we have done it in uh, just a few months. And if you look at what criticism have you heard? Some small criticisms about whether it's realistic to be 100% renewable in 2035, or whether this is a bit too idealistic, but in the, in the general direction, also on many of the specific issues, I heard very little. We have regular our conference calls with uh, big industry representatives. It, it, is, um, it is highly surprising how, how praiseful they are. So uh, I'm, I'm really shocked. Yeah? It's, it's, it's not only opinion polls of ordinary citizens. It's, it's highly confusing for a person like me, my biography, to sit together with the legal leaders of German business, one after the other, saying Robert Habeck is doing a great job. And I'm asking myself, uh, OK, I'll stop here because it's dangerous territory. So it's really interesting how far the consensus has been growing around these issues of energy transformation and uh, reducing, in this respect, red tape, de-electrifying the different sectors of the German economy while at the same time decarbonizing, which uh, is, of course, uh, and with a view of a 100% renewable energy model. And of course, if not a small country, but a middle-sized, globally seen middle-sized industrial country like Germany does this, it will have strong effects globally. And uh, this is what we are doing. Uh, sometimes uh, um, I would like to say that this is also true um, on the level of the measures. So a traditional um, criticism uh, was always, it should all be done with prices. So basically, uh, the price uh, and market instruments should be the only thing in town. We have took, taken another decision. We insist on carbon pricing. We believe that carbon pricing is key in any market economy in order to achieve the needed changes. But it's not sufficient, because if you do everything with prices, it will mean that those who have less feel a strong pressure to change their way of life, while those who are rich can basically pursue their lifestyle. And this will be seen as deeply socially unjust. And therefore, uh, for us, it was always important to have both. We do carbon pricing, in particular with the European tools. And second, we make technical, use technical standards, incentives, uh, subsidies, and also uh, redistribution mechanisms in order to ensure that there is not only one instrument in town. Uh, and uh, even this, which was so often, remember at this horrible book uh, uh, the, uh, the, um, of Hans Werner Sinn, the green paradoxon, criticizing everything which was not about marketing, market instruments, uh, as being a total failure, how small the impact now in public is. So basically, this mix of measures, which are well calibrated, is not fundamentally attacked. And that is very important in order to balance the ecological effect, the investment and economic successes with the social consequences of what we do. And these three have to be in balance. Uh, the whole policies will only be successful if they deliver innovation, investment, and economic opportunities, social balance, as well as the ecological success. So on the European level, uh, I can only say our line is very clear. 
uh, beginning in the coalition treatment and uh, treaty and even more so now, uh, we insist on the full package of the Fit for 55 proposal, which is the key part of implementing the Green Deal. Uh, and we pursue a negotiation position in the European Council to help the Commission and the French presidency to be ambitious. And uh, we know it is not yet ambitious enough for the 1.5 degree but it, uh, objective, but it is an objective piece of policy. No other continent uh, has anything similar. So if Europe succeeds to vote this, it is probably one of the biggest levers Europe has in the hand to shape the history of our world to the better. And therefore, it is so important that the largest economy supports the Green Deal ambition. And, uh, and we have been now, uh, I saw it a bit in the Council, how we were on a slippery slope downwards. And as an effect of the Ukraine-Russian war, I see, bless you, um, I see uh, a, a, a turnaround in this. So there is now a renewed ambition, and we will try to help the French presidency to finish the deal making in the council under their presidency to then enter trilogues with the European Parliament as soon as possible. And uh, on top of these demands in the Green Deal, where obviously for us it is key to receive also macro instruments and not only micro instruments. So we want the ETS2, the second part of emission trading and carbon pricing to be realized with the right uh, tools for social compensations attached to it, so se which belongs to a fully ambitious uh, package. We want basically to, to keep this ambition while at the same time supporting the Commission to top it up with the, with the Repower EU plan. And this is what is now in the deal making in Brussels. And I can only say that this is one of these interesting moments of European politics when, while most people have not even heard about what Repower EU is, uh, big, uh, bold steps are made uh, because the Commission is working on an ambitious plan. And uh, if this is out, there will be a new top-up of the EU proposals for the Green Deal with this uh, Repower EU plan. And um, what we want to see in this Repower EU plan is a fully-fledged industrial policy of Europe for the Green Deal. And this is so far not in the package. What I mean with this is the danger if we boost the use of renewables in Europe it will basically be a huge subsidy for the Chinese uh, renewable industry. This is not a very clever move. And therefore, we have to make sure that uh, we have the, uh, in Europe, we receive the industrial capacity to produce the key transition technologies on world-class level. We have shown with batteries how much Europe can do if we put our forces together, and we can do the same again with PV, with wind, with heat pumps, with electrolyzers. So we need European programs to make sure that these products are also produced here and uh, that we do this uh, using the common market at the right economies of scale. And second, Europe will be more successful in the green transformation if we have the infrastructure in place to do it on a European level. At the moment, uh, the grids for gas and for um, electricity are not properly interconnected with many costs and uh, problems also for the transformation. We have no common railway system, which uh, you could call a common railway system. And uh, therefore, we should boost investment for these common infrastructures uh, which Europe needs in order to be successful. And third, there is a dimension where Europe has done little is so far is to boost energy saving measures in order to reduce the total uh, uh, imports uh, of gas and oil. Because I say that uh, openly, just changing the provider may be important in the short term, but there's of course an obvious danger. So we have had a big public debate, immediate embargo uh, for many progressives, and many were surprised that we didn't support it. We uh, 
And I ha would like to share with you my own reason why I think it was right not to support it right away. If you simply switch the providers, the effect is obvious. You will, you will compete with all the developing world for the remaining traded oil and gas resources, pushing up the price level even further. And that means, basically, uh, you have a good conscience because you can say that um, we are clean of Russian fossils. You have not changed your demand. Uh, and uh, at the same time, of course, the effective, uh, the global price level will increase, which will also help Russia with additional resources, perhaps not on the same level, but it, they will get an even higher price and even tougher competition for the remaining fossil resources. So therefore, I think that it is truly important, while, um, of course, doing what we can in order to limit the revenue to Russia from their exports, at the same time to do something about demand, because if we don't, it is basically not a highly progressive thing to do. And last remark I would like to share with you is that uh, this boost uh, the Green Deal have, has received now in the European institutions, I think uh, it, it goes even a bit further, and it, uh, to my surprise, it has not been noted very much so far in public uh, debate, uh, I would say in general, not in Europe, uh, perhaps in the European Parliament, yes, but in the national publics it has not been noted uh, too much. After the French elections, basically, and after when the parliamentary elections are over, there is a new opportunity to do something about the ability in Europe to act and uh, to, uh, to work together. Why? Macron has not received a proper answer to his original plans before the last election uh, until today. And this was a big debate uh, in Germany, and many were unhappy that our most important and closest partner made bold European proposals, and it was matched by boredom from Germany. Now we wrote a coalition agreement which basically provides an offer. Now, surprisingly, there was no real answer from France. But this was because there were elections. And when you, in the face of uh, Le Pen, uh, go bold measures uh, towards a more integrated Europe, which uh, basically we offered, it, it may also cause additional problems, uh, I put it mildly. So therefore, there was still not a real answer. But the, big import the interesting issue is what will happen on the 9th of May when the future conference, the conference on the future of Europe, hands over the citizens' recommendations, which are basically saying, get your act together and organize Europe in a more democratic and more sovereign and more to, geared towards ability to act with bold measures, hands it over to Ursula von der Leyen, to the president of the European Parliament, Metzola, and to the council. And then when finally the French have finished uh, voting, then the big question is, will France and Germany be able to give an answer leading in cooperation with our partner countries Europe further? That is the big question. And there are big issues on the table. Common defense linked with common arms control. Um, a stronger capacity to take decisions or, uh, without having everybody to agree. Uh, also tackling the obvious social inequalities, uh, which have not been answered inside of the European uh, la, uh, Union to the full. And, uh, and I think that is a, a really interesting moment in European history. And we will see. Uh, and I hope that the German government, the French government, and our partner countries recognize this very special moment of this crisis to get their act together and build a Europe which is stronger and able to act in common and uh, to the best interest of our continent and its children. Thank you.
Thank you, Sven. I knew it would make a difference if a person with such a strong commitment to Europe uh, would mm -hmm. talk about the European Green Deal and the, what's on the, uh, on the agenda. Thank you for this inspiring keynote. So now I welcome uh, my two other guests. I will start with you, Samantha. Uh, you are currently, sorry, I have to fiddle with my papers. I'm there in a minute. You, um, you are a lawyer, but you say that you are also an activist. Um, oh, and you have been working for the last 20 years, I think, on climate, energy, and social justice issues. And now uh, you are the director of the Just Transition Center, which is hosted by the uh, International Trade Union Confederation and other partners, took. But you're based in Norway, actually. I, I hear, uh, where you have worked for a long time. And um, you had, before that, you worked uh, for the uh, Worldwide Funds for Nature uh, Global Climate and Energy Team, and you also had a strong focus on the global Arctic. So I think that's also something quite special, actually, special perspective to bring into this debate. So thank you for being here and for sharing your perspectives on the European Green Deal with us. And then I come to you, Adam. I don't think I need to present you to this crowd, um, but uh, I still will do it. Uh, you are internationally known for your work as an economic historian on the financial crisis of 2008 and most recently on the effects of the COVID pandemic and its mitigation measures on economy, societies, and global relations. You are a professor of economic history at Columbia University, New York, and the director of the European Institute at the same university. And I thank you for having shaped actively our project on transformative responses to the crisis. And we are extremely happy to have you with us also here in person today. So you have listened to the keynote by Sven, and I'm sure you're eager to comment on it. And I would like to invite you first, Samantha. Thank you so much, Imke. Um, so first of all, thanks for the invitation and uh, for a great workshop this morning. I was really enjoying the discussions we had. Um, as I listened to you, Sven, I, I was really inspired by the vision about a European industrial policy, about potentially reshoring some of the supply chains for, uh, for the energy sector, but for other sectors. Um, for the speed of the transformation. And then I was missing some things. I'll just say the things I missed. You know I work for, uh, we're not just hosted by the International Trade Union Confederation, but I work for ITUC, which represents 200 million organized workers in 162 countries, right? So I run a global center for the trade union movement on climate change and, uh, and jobs and inequality. Um, and I was missing that aspect. So um, I think, you know, I, I would really like to see the full transformation. So not just a transformation of systems of production that brings down emissions, and uh, not just efforts to kind of blunt the impacts of carbon pricing or of higher prices uh, related to transition on poor and working class households, but actually a transition that is also about doing something about the deeper structures of inequality, which, you know, as we can see across Europe, inequality is going up. It's going up even in the Nordic countries where I live. It's also going up in Germany. And, uh, and I would like to see that transition, that transformation addressed at the same level of importance as the ecological transition. And maybe this moment offers a lot of opportunities to do that. Um, for example, whether, whether people want to acknowledge it or not, uh, the state has just shown us how big it can be during this period of COVID. And we're going to see how big the state can be in this response, both to the war, to, uh, the, to remilitarization, but also to climate change. And all of those state funds could come with strings attached to them, which would require them to create good jobs. 
So there could be labor standards that are mandatory for all parts of that European supply chain. So we're not replacing uh, slave labor conditions for Uyghurs in China with uh, low wage employment in Central and Eastern Europe on the end of a European supply chain, for example. But also even in Germany, uh, labor standards and good jobs could lift people's boats. I think the other thing that um, that I, and probably you can't talk about these things because you're a minister, whereas I'm a trade unionist, so I can say a lot of things within the, within the framework of, of being a trade unionist. But um, we're also in a situation now where the energy crisis is producing vast wealth for, uh, for some companies and their shareholders. And it's putting many other, many other people living in Europe in, in the position of having to choose between paying their bills and paying uh, and heating their homes. And so isn't there something that needs to be done about that, about that structure of inequality, in addition to the structure of inequality that we have with, with bad jobs, with low wage jobs, with uh, casualization of work, with the lack of permanent contracts for workers? I think one last thing. Um, you know, there are, lot, there are lots of things that, are, that aren't going well with U.S. policy, but one thing that did go well in, uh, in the first part of the Biden administration is that there was a lot of creative thinking about how good jobs can sort of form the backbone for this social transformation. And there was this idea of the soft infrastructure of care jobs and jobs that are typically held by women. Right? And so there's this gender dimension as well of good jobs that we miss when we're only focusing on industrial transformation. So I'll stop there. I loved what you said, but I'm missing this, this other part, also about the rights of workers. Thank you, Samantha. Now, uh, Adam. Just speak and then okay. It's going to turn itself on. Excellent. Well, it's, it, I would like to echo what Sam said. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here, particularly since uh, we've been working online with so many people in this group for such a long time now, and it's uh, kind of dizzying to actually meet people in person. And, and I would really like to echo the, the thanks to you, Sven, for taking the time to, to be with us and to, to speak with us. And um, I'm perfectly happy to act as a sort of straw man to your you know, practical politician figure and, and be the well, some sort of um, a representative neo-Keynesian, um, you know, radical in the exchange. I thought you were a poet. Well, <laughs> we, we can, we can, uh, but the, the, the point that Samantha made is the one that um, is really, I think, the one where I would want to push back. I want to make three points, and that is really the one I want to push back on. Because I think what we can't let stand is the idea that demanding large-scale radical monetary finance action is some sort of harebrained, impractical, theoretical idea that is represented by people who don't have power and therefore can indulge themselves in paper exercises. Because, as Sam was saying, and has been repeatedly demonstrated, and it was precisely out of that experience that this project grew, very hard-nosed, extremely practical people power people of the purest kind, deeply conservative people, in fact, under the right circumstances, faced with the right crisis, have had no difficulty at all in mobilizing trillions of dollars for the purposes of fundamentally, fundamentally conservative purposes. In other words, the stabilization of the existing order, which I don't need to lecture you about, because you, amongst the European parliamentarians, have been one of the most effective advocates uh, for financial reform, and we, owe, we all owe you a great debt of thanks for that work. But the aim of this project was not, as it were, to engage in utopianism, but on the contrary, to say, if that's possible under those circumstances for those ends, why is it not possible for the purposes of large-scale ecological transformation? And I understand there may be some iron curtain, there may be some political line that comes down, but rather than accepting that, the challenge of the kind of politics that you're engaged in is surely to question that and to push back against it. And why is it okay to run a completely incontinent monetary and fiscal policy under circumstances and under certain circumstances and not under others? And I read your reinterpretation of the climate politics in the April program 
as you know, state priority number one. I can't quite remember what the German wording is. But you essentially define it as a national security interest and therefore trumping a whole bunch of other considerations. That seems to me to be a step in the right direction precisely because it might open up this kind of option of saying, well, under those circumstances, it's really whatever it takes is the appropriate formula. And we know how much Europe owes to that formula, whatever it takes. The, the second point I'd like to make is really not a pushback, but it's really just a question. And it's a completely pragmatic one because I'm fascinated by the position that you're in. Um, and folks like you, like ourselves, in fact, are in also in Washington DC right now because lots of people there are having exactly the same experience you're having is, oh my God, what does it mean that I'm all of a sudden the, you know, the successor to Larry Summers or whatever in their case? The question I have, I ask, I, and, and as an outsider is so fascinating about the Harbeck ministry, is that if anyone's ever understood the urgency of the climate problem in government, it's you folks. You look maybe like the first people to really understand the sense in which this needs to be moved, not on a annual or decadal time horizon, but on a quarterly time horizon, like GDP growth or monetary policy. In other words, the appropriate standard is what did we do in the last three months? And then again, what did we do in the next three months? So I'm actually kind of interested if you're able to describe it to us, how your team thinks about this problem of getting to a 7% admissions reduction this year and then doing it again next year. And over the four year period which we hope you govern, it's you know, roughly speaking, 30% that you need to achieve in terms of reduction. Maybe it goes the other way around. Maybe it's 25%. In any case, it has to be a big cut. What does it feel like to govern under the pressure of delivering and not being able to escape? Because you folks know as well as anyone in this room how imperative this objective is. The third question I have goes, again, uh, very much in, in the direction that Sam was pointing to. And it, it, it's about the issue, perhaps, of the international situation of, of the policies that you're pursuing. You, you were very powerful on the European side of this, and I was delighted to hear that, because Veronica Grimm, amongst others, uh, made criticisms of the Easter package precisely in the terms of it didn't have enough of a European dimension. And here today, we were really hearing that European dimension loud and clear. But speaking as somebody who's come across the Atlantic from the US side, I was wondering how far the European conversation at this point still includes conversations about coordination with the United States and what form that is taking. Because uh, this has been a particular interest to the Heinrich Böll Stiftung working groups around this issue. We have a, a group that is meets transatlantically. And one could see a positive version of this. And coming out of Glasgow, we saw the aluminium and steel deal, which looked very positive and interesting. But there's also, of course, a more aggressive version of this relationship, which would center on LNG and American exports of LNG. Not, not simply um, in the short run, but in the lock-in effects. And I think that's what worries the climate left in the United States, is how far Europe's energy emergency is going to facilitate, essentially, the lock-in of carbon infrastructure in the Gulf of Mexico as the hub of freedom gas that Europe will end up relying on. This is obviously a question that goes beyond your specific remit, but it does seem to me when we think about the global transition and that relationship between Europe and the S that was mooted really at Glasgow, that it will be fascinating to hear how your team thinks about that problem. Emma, you know that's not fair, right? Uh, so uh, having two brilliant people bombarding you for 15 minutes with lots of uh, uh, thesis, which uh, all deserve uh, careful um, um, discussion. And uh, uh, first, I would like to say that um, the, the social dimension in the government program is very clear, but it is also limited. And uh, this is part of a compromise. And, uh, and I, uh, you criticized me exactly for what I started with my talk with. So uh, I, have, I have to act on a mandate. And I, we can interpret that mandate. Uh, but there are also clarity. There's also clarity on what we didn't agree. So we didn't agree a big tax reform for social uh, redistribution. We, uh, but uh, to the unhappiness of uh, some of our coalition partners, we didn't agree either uh, to make social cuts and 
redistributing uh, even in another direction. So basically, but there is not, not such a strong mandate for redistribution. What we did is we increased the minimum wage to a level which uh, in Germany it would, will germ put Germany top on the list of minimum wage countries in Europe or very close to the top. And this will benefit mainly women in precarious jobs. To me, uh, one of the most painful parts of the lengthy coalition uh, building agreement was that we were not able to do a really a lot to end precarious employment in Germany, which I think is a huge scandal. It not only uh, uh, concerns Germans, but also people from other EU countries working under conditions which we shouldn't have in Europe er anywhere. And, uh, but this is all part of a compromise. And this means um, these changes uh, have to be uh, done uh, at another moment. Also, the, uh, and what I said in the beginning is, government is, well, basically, it doesn't help if we repeat the, the negotiations of the coalition agreement while governing. Because this would mean that all of us can't do what they achieved. So our liberal partners want now to implement what they received. The Social Democrats, the Greens, what they received. And of course, we have to give answers to new challenges uh, which arise while doing. But uh, calling into question again and again the deal is not helpful. And this is not what progressives in Germany could expect from us. What they should expect from us is that we do, our, uh, do now our job, get the things done we can do uh, in this framework. And um, then there is, of course, uh, a new moment for debate uh, again and again. It will now, of course, be discussed uh, strongly in the Länder elections, which are now coming. And there, again, it is a lot about who pays for the crisis and which role uh, do the federal states play. But, but it doesn't help to repeat these debates uh, on, uh, the, uh, European, uh, on the federal level. Rather, go coalition government works like the liberals call renewable energies now freedom energies. Highly surprising. Great. And we are praising to reduce bureaucracy. And this is what, how government has to function. And the socialists, uh, they also uh, have to uh, pay tribute to what uh, their partners brought to the table. Otherwise, we will have permanent conflict rather than achieving what we achieved. And your job is to, to criticize what we haven't achieved. That's fair. But I, I, would, um, I would also challenge you, because I have been doing tax justice policy so long, in the European Parliament. And one of my biggest problems there was that uh, we couldn't make so much progress. We could make some progress, but a lot of progress was halted because there was no agreement to have majority voting on tax issues on the European level. It's one of the key obstacles for, I for bringing more economic justice in Europe. I, I say I think many people are surprised because in Germany you always discuss wealth taxation and so on. Yes, relevant debates, but on the European scale we compete with each other for less redistribution. And if we want to overcome that, we need majority voting, which we have in our coalition agreement with the support of the Liberals. But the European Trade Union Congress is not even able to support us. And therefore, I would ask you, I, bring, I will be louder uh, on social inequalities when you bring me an ETUC position for majority voting in the European on tax issues. So that would be fair, right? So, um, and uh, I know you can't deliver it because behind these are long traditions and some trade union movements like in Scandinavia being dead against this. But it's basically a cheap service to capital uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, and it's so structurally important. If we could end this stupid tax evasion and tax competition in Europe and have common minimum taxation, it would be such a move forward. And we can't. And we have not even the support of some parts of the 
plural progressives. And that's so disappointing. So, and I've been suffering from that for so many years, and now you are my victim to having to listen to this. And, uh, and, and then, um, well, uh, and beyond that, uh, I would like to insist that when doing climate policies, it's always also with the social dimension in mind. So when we do the pricing, also in the agreement, it says very clearly the income should be redistributed to the citizens. And uh, ideally with the same uh, amount of money per capita, so that after the pricing, we have more social justice than before. So reconciling ecological pricing with more social justice. And this is uh, an important dimension. I know there are many other issues uh, about which I could also speak passionately, but I have no mandate for that. Uh, and um, now, Adam, perhaps I didn't, I was not uh, clear enough. I didn't mean that um, common borrowing uh, progress, uh, changes in monetary policy are only for these Adam's, uh, Adam Tooth people here and the government uh, shouldn't do it. No, I fully agree with you that uh, larger changes, of course, are in the end made by politicians at the right moment. But in particular, in controversial areas, changes by governments are made. They are not coming out of long public quarrels. So if you see the Scholz announcement uh, of the Zeitenwende, mm -hmm. it, it was made with very few uh, coordinating calls and then made. Yeah. So, uh, and, and that is what I'm saying. So having now some state secretaries in the government starting to speak what they think in general and theoretically under certain circumstances about some changes in these highly touchy and controversial issues in Germany is not helpful. I was not saying that this is your dreaming and no, no, that was not my point. My point was at the moment, uh, this is um, your job and uh, it is publicly in no way my job and, but there may be coming a moment when the work of you guys is very valuable so that people inside of governments can do the right things. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, uh, but I know what our mandate is again. So, uh, so then you were saying you hope we are governing for four years. Uh, I, I thought uh, we will not go away so fast. So uh, I, that was not our ambition. And uh, that's what the Chancellor said, what Robert Habeck said, and, and uh, Lindner and so on. So, so we, we don't intend um, to go away so quickly. And I must say that also for the ecological transformation, there's a huge potential to have a coalition between progressives and a part of those representing business and the political right of the spectrum. It's a huge it's a huge benefit because it makes our, cha our policies much less suspicious. However, it causes uh, some limits which are also painful. So there is a, it is not, re um, it is not uh, black or white. And then lastly about the US uh, and uh, our uh, transatlantic um, uh, dialogue. First, I'm not in charge of energy policy and climate policy. That's not what I'm mainly doing. Uh, therefore, I can't uh, talk with a lot of insight about the relationship to our U.S. partners. I can only say we are constantly in a transatlantic dialogue. Robert has, your, uh, has a lot of U.S. partners on the phone regularly. And uh, the point is, uh, when uh, I think there is one misunderstanding about the gas infrastructure investment made in Germany. They are not investments in order to lock in our energy model. Our commitment to 100% renewable future is clear. Uh, however, we have to see that with the current infrastructure, we are locked in to Russian Im uh, gas and oil. And that is why we want to overcome this. And we have to build for this reason infrastructure for gas. However, there's also one misunderstanding, a second misunderstanding when it comes to this. This doesn't mean we will use it for decades. We can't. 
it has to be built in a way that it can be, with the least cost possible, transformed into the infrastructure which will, we will need for green uh, uh, gases. And gas is not a priori fossil. Uh, we will, Germany and Europe will also in the future depend on gas imports. So therefore, some environmental activists criticizing all uh, investment into gas, they forget, uh, from my perspective, that production costs of solar energy is now uh, reaching one cent per kilowatt hour in the global south. And that means that some of the gas will probably come uh, from countries which have more sun uh, than Germany, unfortunately. Although, uh, yeah, so that means, uh, therefore, we will also need gas infrastructure. I know the gas infrastructure we are building now is not exactly the one which we will need for the future. But we will need more gas infrastructure also uh, for trading. And this is sometimes confused in the public debate. So what we invest now is not for new lock-in. It is here to gain more independence from one um, particular nasty supplier. And second, uh, what we really need is to see um, hydrogen as a part of the 100% renewable vision, which of course also has a view to, uh, to opportunities in the global south. So uh, that is what we are doing. And, uh, and not all gas should be seen as evil only because gas is now fossil. We have to make it green. Thank you, Sven. Um, so you have answered um, the unfair questions, <laughs> or the un you have elegantly dealt with the 15 minutes. I know that you have to leave um, very soon, and um, I would just like to uh, use the opportunity and ask you about. You mentioned developing countries. We shouldn't compete with developing. We should reduce our energy demand in in Europe, so we don't compete. Uh, with developing countries um, on that's how I understood your your position. My question is what will uh, you do at the Ministry of the Economy for shaping these partnerships with developing countries? You mentioned uh, sunrich countries now as hydrogen exporters, so that it's not only sourcing uh, or serving our demand for hydrogen, but really uh, helping to to implement the energy transition in those countries because past structures have not actually followed that, that motivation, which has also contributed to their failure, like this attack. And how strong is that sentiment in the, in the Ministry of the Economy that it's also your responsibility and not only the responsibility of, let's say, the development uh, ministry, which would be, a, yeah, I think that's, well, how is this coordination working? Well, um, first I have to say, um Coordinating between ministries is a very interesting uh, adventure I'm, uh, I'm experiencing every day, and I, I'll, I'll stop here. But, uh, but beyond that, this is felt very much as being also uh, a responsibility in our house. So, um, which means you have seen uh, we have regular visits to, to African countries in particular, and, uh, and there... Uh, we have a flagship initiative which is called H2 Global. And this, uh, so for me, the most symbolic uh, is that there's a huge green hydrogen investment in Namibia. So creating employment and investment in Namibia. Everybody knows our history with, an, with this country and the atrocities uh, done by Germans a uh, 100 years ago. And therefore, it is symbolic that our biggest H green H2 uh, project in the south is just there. And, uh, and this is the sort of uh, bilateral development uh, which we are trying to pursue. It's not easy because renewables means capital-intensive investment in government, uh, in, in often countries with unstable government, which, may, which means uh, we need to help to uh, ensure risks uh, in these circumstances. And this is what, what we are doing, what uh, we have already uh, to owe the former government. And I have to say there, Altmaier, he has done some of the right things while blocking a lot of 
Energiewende in Germany, he has done this. And we are pursuing this, and of course we are reviewing constantly with which countries we do this, and, uh, and, but it's very clear, and it, as you said in the beginning, it's in my portfolio, the cooperation with Africa, we are working with German business, NGOs, to help shaping these bilateral investment uh, deals, uh, which of course are not only for exports, but also for helping the countries uh, to provide energy for their own, green energy for their own needs. And I think this is, has tremendous potential because um, unlike our French partners uh, believe in, a, in a big error discuss it nationally, renewable energy is simply cheaper. It is so much cheaper. And uh, it's so funny how people discuss about new nuclear while new PV uh, can produce... Uh, at one cent, two th cent per kilowatt hour in the global south. It's, uh, it's such a clear statement that we won economically. And the only question is whether we can overcome vested interests blocking these investments. And, uh, and I think that's what we, and I would like to say one thing also, because I know this is not loved by everyone, but um, you were rightly pointing to the supply chains and the labor conditions in the supply chains. And, uh, and this also contain, concerns uh, green uh, um, products. And uh, Germany has its own supply chi chain law, and, uh, and we have in the coalition agreement a support for the European supply chain law, law whether, um, uh, which, um, which means that um, Germany is uh, in general supportive for a strong European law checking the supply chains from a human rights perspective, from a social and environmental perspective. And if, if the pooled European demand uh, will be checked against uh, due diligence in these, uh, in these areas, it will have a truly global effect. And therefore, uh, alone for this, uh, I think it would be worth pursuing this uh, government, because it is really big. And we know how big the resistance is. And I've heard so many actors saying, ah, oh, no, it's so the Ukraine crisis. You have to immediately stop the uh, um, Lieferkettengesetz, a horrible German word, eh? the supply chain law. And uh, no, we will not. So this is in the coalition agreement. We want to, have to see this. We are, of course, ready to do the implementation in a work, way that it doesn't overburden small companies, but we will not give up uh, that uh, our demand in Europe has to be serious about the social consequences and ecological consequences that it has in poorer countries of the world. And I think there we can really make a difference, and I hope that Europe will vote this very soon. And uh, I hope on civil society support. Uh, in the future as well when it comes to this on the European level. Thank you, Sven. Um, I'm a bit uh, confused now because you said you had to leave at 7, so I uh, give I you a chance to... It's not about one minute, but mm. it's, uh, I have to go to defend some of our trade policy issues. And uh, I thank you for the invitation. Ah, the microphone. Sorry, I, um, I have now to go to defend some of our reforms on trade policy. I hope this finds also in particular your support because it's very much about labor standards as well. But I have to go now. I have to apologize. And uh, we, um, we are seeing each other again, I hope. And I thank you for this great work and bringing these uh, people together. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Sven. So, um, we are left with, uh, with some time, and I actually would like to invite now the, um, th this debate will change now. Obviously, we are leave, uh, losing the German government <laughs> presence. This is a pity, but it was great to, to have the, the hour, actually, with, with Sven. I think it brought some, some insights. Um, and now we could actually focus again on maybe your perspectives also on, uh, I would not ask you now, has Sven convinced you yeah, about the seriousness of the German approach? I think, 
uh, that we can discuss later when we go have drinks and food. But um, uh, the, the question, I think, is um, what are your perceptions on... Um, we have heard a very optimistic pers uh, description, actually, by Sven, uh, on European unity, on unity in Germany. Um, uh, how, what is your um, perception of, of the, the tr truly transformative capacity of the European Green Deal to achieve these triple object, uh, let's, the dual objective of f combating climate change and achieving uh, social justice or reducing at least inequalities? I'm not talking about financial stability now. That's the third objective of the project, I, I know. What would be, maybe I, we start with you and then with you and then think of what you want to say and ask and contribute. I will call the, pub, the, the audience then. Well, well, I'm still very much digesting what we just heard, but it was striking to me that he didn't respond to the question about hate and violence. Mm. So he used the he used the the, um, he used the unfortunate exit I provided him by projecting my American mindset of four years at a time, and you don't even actually you don't actually think beyond two years in the American context. So he used that as a way of avoid, I don't know whether it was deliberate or not, but he didn't answer the question about pace, which for me is the single most interesting and important issue in the current moment, is um, you know, we need to see a 25% reduction in German emissions over the lifetime of this four-year coalition, 25%. That's staggering. And that means that every single corner, quarter counts. And it's all very well to propose a package of legislative changes the details of which you aren't going to work out through to the summer, I gather, because they don't even have the staff in the ministry, because Altmaier gutted the relative de re relevant departments. Um, but that means you lose two quarters, right? And, and, and you've got 16 quarters to do 25% reduction, and you've burnt two. Like this is a this is an incredibly tight timetable we're on, and so that issue of pace seems to me to be at the heart of absolutely everything. And I understand that they understand it, but the, the delivery is the crucial issue, right? And, and that's something you ought to be able to, I mean, it's brutal. It's like accepting a new measure like GDP growth or inflation, which from my macroeconomic background is what I'm used to thinking in terms of, and it's not unreasonable to pace and benchmark GDP. We, we do it every quarter. The US had a bad number last quarter. Everyone is freaked out. Why, why is CO2 not yet in that space? Did we have a good or a bad quarter? Is kind of what we need to know. Anyway, that, that's, that, I, I was sorry we didn't hear more on that count. Yeah, I agree, that's true. I was waiting for him to talk, but then he talked about um, inequality and, and uh, yeah. Samantha, what is your take? Yeah, well, I want to pick up on what you said about PACE, Adam, because um, over the last year or so, we've been involved in a process with basically all of the industrial unions across Europe, um, as well as uh, national confederations, especially from Central and Eastern Europe. And the overwhelming view is that the transition is just going so fast. How will workers keep up? And that is, um, and that was before the war. Um, it was before the energy crisis really got going, and it was basically everything from leadership to shop floor experience of older workers who are facing a digital transformation. They're facing a transformation of. Um, uh, kinds of production, let's say from internal combustion engines to EVs with a lot of job losses, especially out in the supply chain. And they're also facing globalization. And the German unions have been great, actually, at sort of mapping at every work site the impacts of these three forces on jobs. So the three are EV transition, Digital. Green transition overall, digital yeah. and globalization. Right. And so I guess um, now we're in a situation when the, where we're going to speed up this transition in Europe, right? So there's going to be this period where there's burning more coal. Um, you're seeing this around the world, really, right? Because gas prices are so high, there's no transition to the bridge of natural gas, just coal to whatever. Um, 
but uh, but now the transition needs to go even faster, as you said. And so I, you know, other than in our movement, I'm not hearing any uh, very strong commitments to or clear thinking around or policy measures that are directed at supporting people as they're moving through this incredibly fast transition. And it's not that anyone in organized labor is opposed to industrial transition. It's happening all the time. This is part of our history. Um, sometimes getting new skills can be an opportunity to upgrade your job and get better results in collective bargaining. But this is going to happen so quickly that all of the great plans, for example, that were reached um, with the German coal compromise and the supports to, to coal regions and more broadly in Europe with the just transition mechanism, like it's not gonna be enough if we're going to do it that much faster. So, so that, uh, and I, I'm not, as I said, you know, people, and also as the state secretary said, he's bound by his coalition agreement. So there are lots of things he can't talk about because he would be opening that up. But, uh, but it's hard to see how you can achieve that speed unless it's matched by instruments at the national and European level, including financing that will help people keep up with this speed. And do your, this is so fascinating, do your members like weight those relative forces? Because if you look at the, like, the McKinsey studies for Europe, the energy mm -hmm. transition is relatively minor in terms of job loss. And they put a huge emphasis on digitization, which they think is going to churn something like, it's also an almost an order of magnitude more jobs from digital transformation than from the energy transition. Do, in your, the debate within your organizations, is there a sense of the relative impact of those three forces? Um, probably, I mean, it differs from country to country, right? So if you're talking to the US labor movement, uh, we would certainly be talking about globalization as a thing that already hit the US through free trade agreements, uh, outsourcing and offshoring. Um, but certainly that, um, the green transition, and then digitalization in, and automation is often sort of the thing that employers will use to scare us into accepting bad wages, right? Like, be nice in collective bargaining, or we're going to give your job to a robot. But what we're actually not seeing in this period where we have had increased digitalization and autom automation is increases in productivity, which you would expect to see if you were per worker, which you would expect to see, for example, in the US. Um, if automation were having this enormous impact. So color me, if not skeptical, at least neutral on the real impacts of automation and digitalization on this, I, you know, who am I? But uh, I think many people in our movement would not agree with the way McKinsey has analyzed that. Um, I, promised, I promised the audience that they could also, yeah, I see fingers being raised, so. You can um, start. We, we have, I was told, uh, uh, 15 minutes left, so we, we stop at uh, 7.30. Um, and, uh, yeah. I think it's on, yeah. It's on. Yeah, I think it's on. You were, though. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Um, I'm Katie Kedward from University College London. Um, I wanted to come back to this idea of pace that Adam just mentioned and obstacles to achieving this transformation at the pace needed. Um, so we're currently um, facing supply-side inflation across Europe, um, as well as in other places. And the ECB finds itself without the tools to actually deal with this inflation. So rising interest rates will um, push economies into recession, as well as exacerbating the cost of living crisis. Meanwhile, unwinding QE programs um, kind of threatens to trigger financial market turmoil. And both of these policy levers obviously also threaten to derail the much needed investment that's needed to um, achieve the Green Deal and the objectives of the industrial strategy that's, that Sven has just outlined. So my question is, um, you know, at this juncture, um, what, what is the role of the ECB after the Zayton vendor? Um, Sven outlined a, a number of highly surprising um, developments at the start of his keynote. Um, I wonder if um, you guys on the panel uh, to what extent you think there's also an opening to the end of a concept of a inflation targeting central bank? And if so, you know, what is the pathway to, to that kind of meaningful mandate reform? That's for you, clearly. Um, I'm afraid I'm not optimistic about that at all. 
Um, um, I think all the signs, I mean, we've been a bit distracted um, in recent months by other events, but if you think back to the beginning of the year and, you know, we all remember the seesawing on the ECB board with, you know, conservative messaging, panic in the bond markets, softer mess messaging, a retreat to empiricism, and then the war started. Um, and so I I've heard a lot of speculation about some kind of bargain where, in fact, fiscal policy remains activated and fiscal monetary policy goes conservative. The Germans get their ECB back. Isabel Schnabel turns out to be a kind of stalking horse for a green conservative monetary policy after all. Um, I don't see, I, there's loads of people in this room who've got great reads on the ECB, but I'm, I'm not, um, I don't see any particular reason for optimism at this point. I think there were certain victories that were made in terms of greening certain understandings of ECB policy, but when it comes to the fundamentals of making this macro call, I don't see a lot of consideration on their part for the potential implications for the energy transition, the Green Deal, for instance. I don't see that joined upness. Rather the rather the opposite, there's some sort of perverse complementarity where a little more radical energy on the fiscal side and industrial policy side is offset politically by a little more conservatism on the monetary policy side, regardless of its you know, the fact that no one can actually show any relationship between interest rate movements and this type of inflation. I mean, why would you even imagine there would be any unless you were just going to do demand destruction, so-called? And the willingness to talk in those kind of terms is highly significant and goes back to that point I was exchanging with Sven. Like, why is it okay to talk about demand destruction in the zone of monetary policy, which is openly the discourse there, the big kosh, just that's hit the economy hard to kill inflation, Whereas we're so delicate when we talk about the costs of energy transition management, you know, it's like there all of a sudden the parameters are very different. So I, I don't know, maybe this, there really is, there's an amazing amount of ECB <laughs> expertise in this room. So shut up. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, I, I will join Adam in being very skeptical. In my intervention this morning, I made a point that, in a sense, what is going to, to be a very important thing to, for us to think through in the macrofinancial architecture is the fact that under monetary dominance, you, fossil inflation will always trigger a contractionary response that will make life very difficult. But I, I was curious about your reflections. I think for somebody like me who works on macrofinancial issues that are associated with a green transition, we don't have the tools to think through what it means on the worker side. I mean, we understand the distributional politics on, on some macro level. And you mentioned something about financing instruments that need to be available for workers to somehow uh, at least not be as brutally hit as they, they will be by a series of, of events that are re related to the climate crisis. So can you say a bit more, what do you have in mind? And is there a, a, a private public divide in there in some ways, in the, in the way that, for example, Sven Giegold evoked, and, and it's quite, uh, I would say, quite powerful politically in, in terms of macro narratives here in Germany, but also in Brussels? Yes. Well, so uh, so just to just to sort of tweak the the framing of the question a little bit, if I can, right? So um, so when we're thinking about when we're thinking about the green transition and what does it mean for workers, uh, there's a tendency to go immediately to poll work, uh, coal workers in Poland or Bulgaria, right? That's what this is about. It's about smoothing impacts, regional impacts, but. You're also talking about this opportunity to create, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of what could be good jobs, but at the moment often aren't good jobs, right? Because as Ben said, because of the casualization of work um, across Europe and, and around the world, and also because of um, the import of uh, of working people into Europe on sometimes slave labor-like conditions. So, um, so policies that target job creation or good job creation would do a lot to reduce inequality as well as to build a natural broad base for this transition, right? And I have to say that in the work that we do, the single most popular thing that we, we say to workers when we're you know, talking, we work only with um, unions from high emitting countries and high emitting sectors. So 
So when, when we're working with a union and its members, the single most important thing we have to answer is what are the new jobs? Are they good jobs? How do we get those jobs? Right? Everything else is, is secondary. Um, so that would, be, that would be a kind of filter that I suggest macroeconomic policy should go through. Like, are these policies designed to create jobs? Are they going to be good jobs? Where are they going to be? Um, what about this element of, of offshoring and globalization? And then the, the other part of it is that, um, you know, the EU has different financial instruments now to fund the transition, right? There's the Recovery and Resilience Fund. Um, there's the Just Transition Mechanism and Fund. There's whatever the EIB and EBRD are going to do in connection to the Just Transition Fund. And when we're looking at this, not only for industrial sectors, but also for all the other sectors like food and agriculture and tourism and hospitality, for example, that also need to transition and to bring down emissions or construction or transport, we look at those funds and they are really just not enough to pay for modernizing production, um, reskilling of people, and also um, also people will need social supports, right? You need unexpand, uh, you need expanded unemployment insurance. You need bridges to pension for older workers, um, and you will also you will also need money to so that people can get retrained without having to pay for it themselves or take take time off of work to do it. So I know that many of the things I'm describing are, are down here, but I would say that um, just two things about the macroeconomic aspects. Inflation is, of course, super regressive for the poor and the working class. At the same time, high interest rates and destroying demand, that's about putting people out of work, right? And so uh, <laughs> the plea to the macroeconomists in the room is really to look for these policies that are going to drive the creation of good jobs, which is the main tool that we have to reduce inequality in, in most societies. Thank you, Samantha. You have been waiting for yeah, a long no, time. No, no, I, it actually follows on what you've just said. And I would like to go back one second to what was then at some point said about you know, repowering Europe, right? And sort of industrial policy for Europe. I was surprised that uh, to a certain extent that way of thinking industrial policy doesn't go exactly in the direction we're mentioning. Um, and so the question is really how from your, you know, privileged kind of perspective, you know, looking across all the different uh, discussion in Europe on reindustrialization, reshoring, and, you know, the kind of uh, technological transition, digitalization, the type of things you were mentioning, um, how confident you are that or, you know, what is your expectation around this new type of industrial policy approach and if this is going to uh, rebalance Europe uh, or create even further concentration. Because we have been seeing that actually industrial capacity has been concentrating dramatically, mm. and that has created the kind of uh, instability and the kind of social uh, turmoil that uh, we have seen in terms of casualization of jobs, in terms of uh, not sustaining basically the, the transition itself. So I'm curious about how much also the unions are involved in designing this industrial strategy, and how much we are avoiding, again, in other situations where the industrial policy works for the country that relatively needs less industrial policy, uh, i.e. Uh, Germany, right? So a country which has its own industrial policy will always keep having that. What about the rest? What about the periphery in Europe? And what about the sustainability of that type of model? This is such a great question because um, we've, done a, we've done a kind of survey or a dialogue with unions across Europe about whether, uh, whether the government is engaging in what we would call social dialogue with them and the employers, right? Which is basically the idea that there is a, usually a binding negotiation between the, three, the two or three social partners about things related to the world of work. And that's especially for things like how the resilience and recovery funds would be spent and also, um, also for these plans under the just transition mechanism. And the answer is it's pretty bad. Right? And especially, as you might guess, in the periphery where trade unions were weakened by the neoliberal opening of these countries, and, uh, and also where you often have governments that are, um, that are anti-union, right? Just straight up, that's part, that's part of their, their, political, their political approach, and you have employers that are taking advantage of that. Um, the, I think 
I mean, I was thinking as Sven was talking that um, now is the time if you are, uh, if you're uh, Bulgaria or Poland or Romania, now is the time to extract concessions and not just concessions about, you know, lifting the hammer of the rule of law violation, but also concessions about what you need for industrial investments. Because it's true that a lot Although you can say great things about European industrial strategies, um, they are concentrating resources in the wealthiest parts of Europe, particularly in the north. And so um, you can't just keep attracting private investment to Central and Eastern Europe by making to tax havens or you know, lightening up labor regulations or paying people less and less. So there must be some other mechanisms also at European level that are going to you know, drive investment to the periphery, and now would be the time to, to demand those. And one other thing about European industrial policy, we may not be totally happy with it, but I have to say, you know, in the US, uh, Canada, it's like we're just rediscovering industrial policy and how great it is. And because in the US you can't get it through Congress, you're doing it by executive order, right? With these strategies around batteries and, uh, and around, uh, you know, Buy American and so on. So we don't, we don't like it, but we have more than most people. So, um, so that would be a main area of improvement. Social dialogue and also um, tools to drive investments into Central and Eastern Europe, especially. Thank uh, you, Samantha. Adam. D and it does also seem to me, I mean, I was very struck by Sven's quick point, you know, well, if we just increase spending on solar and wind, it would be industrial policy for China, and that's not a good thing. You know, and at some level, obviously, well, well, it seems to me we actually need a holistic evaluation of the issue of pace. Um, and where we actually think the vast majority of the jobs, the good jobs, the relatively stable long-term jobs in the energy transition are going to be, and are they going to be in glamorous new photovoltaic factories that you somehow manage to make competitive in Germany, or are they going to be in the installation? Are they going to be in refurbishing millions and millions of houses and buildings? Are they going to be in sectors which are much less exposed to global competition and which, def which offer the chance for steady, long-term, well-paid uh, employment rather than being exposed to what is essentially a commodity sector? Photovoltaic panels is a global commodity sector. If you had to set out to create well-paid jobs for p folks in high-income countries, you would not throw them into the maelstrom of competing in photovoltaic production. Um, maybe windmills a little bit more because windmills are more bespoke. They're not quite so run of the mill. But photovoltaics is, seems to me to be chasing a, a rabbit. Unless there is some particular argument you could make for regional policy or there's some technological lead that we need to be. And that was the case with batteries, I think, because batteries are so fundamental to so many other steps. And, and, and I, I would, I, from, from, from a tactical point of view, amongst other things, it seems to me we really need to do that holistic assessment and not allow, and this is very striking in the US case, this um, entire issue to be basically overlaid with a series of nationalist concerns, essentially, with a securitization discourse, which is very powerful in the US right now. Is the coalition that we can build around these things essentially one of a, an anti-Chinese front? Um, and all of those, I think, require an evaluation which, which, uh, which is also fundamentally under the sign of saying we need to reduce emissions by 25% in four years. So where are we going to get the photovoltaic panels to do the first two years of that from? It is surely not going to be from a factory anywhere in the EU. I yeah, really thank want you. to argue with Adam. Can I do that? Well, yeah, you can do that, but then I would like to close. And okay, uh, really quickly. Before you, but before you <laughs> answer, I would just uh, like to remind us of uh, there was an evaluation of that, actually, in Germany. What were the, It was done by the Ministry of the Environment, and they evaluated um, the econo where was the main economic impact of, of the increase of renewable energies. And it was in the... In, not in manufacturing, installation. it was installation, it was services, and uh, what's local, so it's the local economy. But for that, of course, you need a well-trained labor force, and uh, so that's also investing in qualification, in good jobs, in, in well-remunerated. Uh, and I, I like your point about pace um, there, but your rebuttal now. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, so the reason why solar panels from some parts of the world are cheap are because people are um, working under slave labor-like or literally slave labor-like conditions, right? Okay. And so the, uh, th what, what you get when you have least cost global procurement in the energy sector is you get labor arbitrage, that is a part of it. It's not that the other input costs to production are necessarily so much lower. They could be, but like the cost of case, capital right? can, be, can be lower. The yeah. You might be closer to the source of the silica, yeah. but you might be state subsidized. But you are also purchasing with your reduced price, you're purchasing labor arbitrage. And generally, um, one of the reasons why, um, you know, across different sectors, it's often cheaper to um, have poorly paid workers with poor health and safety conditions producing something or doing construction even in Europe than it is to automate. I mean, many of, many of the things we're talking about, like the production of, of photovoltaic panels, um, you could innovate and improve the process, but that's gonna require investment, and so instead it's cheaper to use up people in that process. I think the other, the other thing, okay, just one other thing. Um, I mean, maybe installing solar panels is a good job in, in Germany, but generally across Europe and, and in, uh, in Western countries, construction jobs are dangerous. People, in fact, the, the two sectors in Europe that have the highest number of fatalities every year are construction and mining. They wear out your body pretty early. They're poorly paid. There's a ton of illegality, of not only of labor dumping, but of people just not having contracts, not getting paid, and so on. And so we, we shouldn't kind of romanticize uh, those jobs. They're bad jobs quite often, and also in Germany. And question, we have to the, make them the, good. The question, the question is, is, not, is not whether one should accept the status quo. The question is, where do you concentrate your attention in crafting the strategy, right? W w where do you put the energy in trying to craft a just transition? And so it's a question of a holistic evaluation of where exactly the cost advantage comes from, and <laughs> to the extent that it's the result of completely unacceptable labor practices, evidently there's a case for offsetting that. And clearly with regard to construction labor too, there are, there's evidently a case for ensuring that those jobs are not shitty jobs. But you still have to make the assessment strategically where your focus is going to be and where the number of jobs are going to come from, right? If I understood you correctly, the, one of the key concerns from your members is simply where are those jobs going to come from? How many are there? Where are they? And in, I think in any quantitative evaluation of the energy transition, the quantity of jobs is going to be in the installation. Um, and it's not we're not just talking about building industrial solar farms. We're talking about the transformation of the insulation of every domestic building across the continent. Um, I mean, there's no question, there's no question that one of the easiest things that could be done right now to reduce energy demand would be to roll out massive government procurement systems with labor standards to like retrofit every existing building, right? And to do it for free or in some, some very concessionary way for poor and working class households. But we don't, we would also have to train up a massive number of construction workers and installers, right? And so, you know, you can't, so you can't, so in these analyses, I'm just saying, you have to look at all of these things at once. Like, we can't accept that we're going to get cheap solar on the backs of people who are being exploited. Like, we can never accept that as trade genius, and as progressives, no one else should be accepting it either, right? You just can't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, let's let's um, give a big applause to to the two of you. <laughs> and I really would like to thank you because I, it's it's rare to have such a combination of perspectives and and analysis where where the the question of how do we achieve. Um, a rapid change in uh, energy policies and in climate policy, but with, with a strong consideration of labor issues, and not only uh, talking about economic and, and uh, policy and, and public su uh, subsidies for that in the abstract, 
with, I think with this combination here, it got very specific, very concrete. And I thank you for that. And now we have some final words from, from the organizers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think this is the time where we can go offline again. Um, and yeah, we just wanted to uh, thank all of you for, for making your way out here. I mean, it's been quite the ride for both uh, Adam and, and you, Samantha. And uh, we have a couple of uh, thank yous for, uh, or little, little something to, to nibble on on your uh, flight home. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but chocolate is a, is a good thing out here in, in Germany. Also for you, Emma, uh, thank you very much for, for the excellent facilitation. We really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, to all of you, maybe we can have one uh, more round of applause for everyone that sort of helped organize this. Also the, all the Burr staff. <clears throat> um, I, I think we can all see that, yeah, in-person events still are a, a, a different thing in, in a way. And, um,